You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. I'm Bill Powers, it's Mining Stock Education, and in today's show, I'm gonna talk about how to make big profits on small mine. Now, when you're talking about the opportunity in smaller mining stocks, and the potential to make outsized gains, I'm not talking about exploration companies. If you have a management team that isn't going after a big uh, deposit, potential deposit that they would find, uh, don't even bother. So in that case, the adage, go big or go home, is 100% valid. The major miners, they want five plus million ounce gold deposits, multi-million ounce gold deposit. Barrick's on record saying that they want at least a half a million gold ounces of production a year for at least 10 years. So if you add that together, that's a five million ounce deposit and they want it in the lowest quartile. Now that would be classified as a world-class project. So even if you're invested in a miner, a junior explorer co that finds a couple or a few million ounces, you're gonna be paid uh, well if you got a good exploration, if you got a good entry point, excuse me. But in general, when I'm talking about investing in small junior mining stocks that have big potential, for you, I should clarify, it may not have potential in terms of future production or size of resource, but but you in terms of where your entry point is and where your exit point is, don't focus on explore codes. In fact, when I focus on explore codes, I focus on ones that are going to find something, hopefully in the realm of what a barrack or what a Newmont wants. Those are the type of ex- exploration companies you wanna go to. If, if you're gathering from management that they're not going after something big, you know, don't even bother when it comes to exploration companies. So that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about buying small miners that could potentially yield you as the investor in in a trade or in a 12 to 24 month old hold a substantial return. It's said for the reason why you wouldn't want to focus on small miners is that they have all the problems of bigger mines, but they don't possess the big upside that big mines have. And this is generally true, but you have an advantage as a small investor. If you're investing, let's say somewhere between five and $50,000 in a smaller illiquid junior before it has a nice move, you can see a five to 10 bagger and you should be able to liquidate over a period of weeks, let's say, and turn $10,000 into $50,000 or turn $40,000 into $320,000. And, but you have to do it investing in the right project at the right time with near-term significant catalysts. And generally what you wanna look for in my observation, in my experience, if you're willing to go into a smaller project is something that is late stage and or near-term producer or current marginal producer. In 2016, when I began to invest in junior mining stocks, one of the companies that I bought was Impact Silver. And this is a marginal, small underground silver project in Mexico, uh, not run by a world-class mining team. And I bought it for around 10 cents US. And I believe over the next six months, it ran up to somewhere around a dollar. So it was about a tenfold gain. I didn't sell it for a tenfold gain, but nonetheless on paper, I experienced a tenfold gain and that was enough to get me hooked on the sector. I think I sold it for like a five or six bagger at some point d- during 2016. But but that's an example of a, of a single project, small marginal producer that was bought at the right time at a cyclical downturn with the commodity silver going from 14 bucks to 21 bucks. And as the commodity went up 50%, this little junior mining stock went up tenfold. Another example would be a small gold producer in Mexico, Monero Alamos. Uh, I did not uh, own, nor do I currently own Monero Alamos, but if you look at the chart, in May of 2019, you could have bought it for 10 cents Canadian, but 18 months later, In November of 2020, uh, when gold was rip roaring, uh, right after that, it was 78 cents Canadian. So there you have nearly an eightfold gain. If you bought it at about 10 cents and sold it somewhere up by 78 cents, in 18 months, you're looking seven to eightfold gain. And again, that's an opportunity, and it's not a big project, in, in a small, 
soon to be producer that you can get those type of gains. Today, that company is something like Canadian 72 cents, I believe when I looked with a market cap of 320 million. So a lot of these, these smaller late stage projects or near term producers or small marginal producers, they could have market caps anywhere between 10 and $70 million. But you could see those market caps go up to anywhere between 100 and a half a billion dollars in the right environment. And so, again, as the small guy with, let's say, 10 to $50,000, you can make significant type of money. If you're a big player, a lot of times when the stocks are down at 10 cents, you know, there's not enough liquidity for you to take a $3 million position unless it's through a private placement. But uh, I'm primarily talking about buying in the open market also when I'm when I'm sharing some of these ideas. So generally, how can you make big profits off of small mines? Uh, the best place to look I'll say it again, is late stage projects with near term production potential and you want them to have limited hurdles to production or to increasing production. And you want to focus on getting a good entry point and you want to focus on making sure you have strong tailwinds from a rising commodity price. Now, when you're looking at the low entry point, there's simple things you can do. Compare, look at the 52 week trading range. Are you at the lower end of the 52 week share price trading range. That would obviously let you know you're probably closer to a good entry point than not. Uh, compare the current market cap to the historical value of that asset. A lot of these late stage projects, sometimes it's a project that was a producer that stopped producing due to low commodity prices and then it just sat on the back shelf or wasn't valued by a producer if it was just one asset in their portfolio, perhaps a new management team picked it up and did some updated economic and uh, reserve studies and they wanna raise the money, bring it into production again. And what was that asset valued at in a previous iteration in a company? And if the market cap is 10 to 20 million, but previously that same asset was valued at 50 to 80 million in, in a different issuer. There, there again is a comparative metric that lets you know perhaps you could be getting a good entry point. And then I always, when I'm talking to management about a situation like this, I always wanna know what is my potential entry point if I'm buying in the open market at the current share price relative to management and key shareholders average cost basis. You always got to ask this question, not just when you're investing in a, in a pre IPO deal or an IPO deal, but even if the company has been trading for years, when you're talking to management, always ask them, what is your average cost basis? How did you acquire the shares? What is the average cost basis of your key shareholders and how did they acquire their shares? And what is very attractive to me is when I can get a good entry point on a relative 52 week share price trading basis, uh, on a basis of the historical value of this particular asset. And also when I can buy shares near or below what management acquired their shares for. And I recently took a position in a company in which I was buying my shares at about half of what a lot of the key managers and key shareholders bought their shares for. Uh, just due to the depressed nature of the current valuation of the company. And so that's what you want to look for. Now, if management has shares that are cheaper than yours, that's, that's not an immediate write-off. You just have to know, did they earn those shares? Did they get those shares in a fair way? And are they looking to hold on to those shares while they create you, the shareholder value, in the process, not trying to dump those shares on the unsuspecting public. And management, I have no problem with management getting shares cheaper than me, so long as they earned those shares and it wasn't just gifted to them just so that they could have the privilege of having those shares without having done the necessary work of putting the project or the company together in order to, to bring it to market. So they can be paid in those shares if they earn those shares, but then you want to know that they're holding those shares. So we're talking about investing in, in smaller projects, not world-class, not even tier one projects necessarily. So if you've identified one, a company that you think is good and you've determined that it's a good lo low entry point to take that position, the company also has to have some type of competitive advantage to make up for its smaller scale. Is it a, is it a high quality 
management team. It may not be one of the famous mining entrepreneurs and their family and the whole investing entourage that comes into all their deals. But it, but is this a is this a management team that had success working for a bigger miner, uh, bringing assets into production? But but now they're out on their own and they've launched their company and they are uh, they're good management and they're qualified for what they're to do. And so that could be an advantage if you have a high quality management team. And, and remember, you know, I heard somebody critique once uh, a, a CEO of a just IPO a mining company and kind of like scoffed a little at their initial investment, which I think was like $50,000 or something like that in, in the seed round of, uh, of a company that was brought to market. And what they may not have factored is you don't just factor when you're analyzing management and skin of the game, how much they're putting in, because you, you have to analyze it relative to their network, net worth and their past career. So if you were a successful geologist working for a, a larger Minor or working for an explore co and maybe you didn't have a lot of options. You just had a nice salary, but you were responsible for the geological success that that company experienced. Well, you have a lot of geological su success, but you don't necessarily as an employee that doesn't translate into financial success. So if if the geo, let's say he's a male, has a wife who stays home with the kid, they're one income. And if he puts fifty thousand dollars into the deal that he's in charge of, well, that could be a lot of money because maybe he only has $75,000 saved up and he just put in two thirds of his life savings into that company. So just, just factor those things in because you could find a lot of good management teams that may not have notoriety as the lead promoter, but they could bring success from their corporate career or, or working for under another management team in an explore co, let's say, or a developer into the deal that they're in charge of. So the company has to have some type of competitive advantage to make up for its smaller scale. Uh, it could be a top tier management team, as I said. It often is, in my observation, existing infrastructure or sunk capex that is sunk into it so that you don't just have a resource or a reserve with an economic study, but you actually have, let's say, tailings dam, you have road, you have power, you could have a ball mill, and uh, you could have just existing infrastructure there, hundreds of millions of dollars of inf infrastructure, and the market is giving it absolutely no value. That was one of the things that drew me to Trillion Energy when I invested and featured that company first, like 15 months ago, or, or whatever it has been at this point. Uh, all the infrastructure today, to put that infrastructure in place, it'd probably be $800 million US would be my estimate, and Trillion owns 49% of it. Uh, another company that we featured in a past sponsor is Dore Copper. They had the, the existing mill, uh, they had the, the tailings dam, they had the roads, they had the power that was already there on site. You had all of that infrastructure that the market is not giving much value to, let alone the resource. So those are things that are attractive because it kind of provides a, a floor to the valuation. And of course it will help, it will lower CapEx to recommence production and, and it will give you a baseline for the valuation of the company. Uh, what's another competitive advantage? Uh, high grade resource. You, you, if you're not gonna have a large resource, you really do have to have it compensated by having a very high grade resource. And I should say with no metallurgical issues. And metallurgy for newer mining investors listening to me, that has to do with the process of extracting the valuable minerals out of the rock. Because it doesn't matter if you have 20% zinc in the rock, but upon going through the process, you can only extract 60% of that 20% zinc in the rock. Well, that lowers the value of that, the ore significantly, doesn't it? So there are some cautions. Uh, and a lot of times these these projects are, as I've kind of alluded to and stated already, they're, they're recycled projects. There's a different operator in charge of them. So make sure there's no fatal flaws to them or, or significant warts that will derail the successful moving forward of the project. So metallurgy is one you would want to look at. You also want to look at permitting because what's the mine worth if, if it can't be brought back into production? Make sure there's no issues there with permitting. You can just do Google, Google searches to just see if there is a, 
been issues in the past. Check out if there's any First Nations issue, conflicts. Those are some of the things. And then just dig a little deeper. Type the name of the deposit in. Type the name of the previous operator and just see what comes up. Get your questions together so when you call management, those are some of the first questions you ask. And, and those are really anytime a management team uh, either brings to me or I go to them with questions, I always ask, okay, why was the past operator not successful? What are you going to do differently? And how are you going to overcome the issues that they had? That's what I bring up. And then I always bring up what they paid for their shares and sell me on why the current share price is a good entry point for me to initially buy your stock. And then you're going to want to have significant catalyst ahead of you. So for the Monero Alamos going from 10 cents to 78 cents from mid 2019 to the end of 2020, gold, we had a bullish tailwind in gold. Uh, Impact Silver in 2016 for me from January to I think August of 2016, silver went from 14 bucks to 21 bucks. So you want that catalyst because it's really hard to fight against a bearish commodity in this sector in, in which money can flow in or flow out so quickly. If you don't have the tailwinds blowing in your sales from a rising commodity price, it's very difficult. But the opportunity is if you can get positioned in some of these smaller miners that have catalysts that they can control in terms of achievement of production or coming into production or developing coinciding with a rising commodity price that's when you get those five to ten baggers in 18 24 months or less sometimes another catalyst just because we're talking about small cap stocks is awareness of the value proposition you know you discover something before other people discover it. Or with how it works, if a new group is in charge of an asset, they structure things and they kind of set out the next 12 to 24 months of timeline of catalysts. They position coinciding with a commodity bull market, the commodity that they're mining, at least the anticipation that the commodity will rise. And then most of them will strategically plan out an awareness campaign. So if you can get in anywhere near the beginning of this new management team and their, the launch of their awareness campaign coinciding with real value creating catalysts, you can do really well. And some other um, catalysts could be a permit. Although the permit itself, you know, sometimes that's baked into the cake. Um, it could cause a little 10, 15% rise I've seen on the day that it's issued. But a lot of times for these smaller projects, a lot of times when you talk to the management teams, they're pretty confident, at least in what they convey to investors such as myself that talk to them, that we're only moving this forward and I only put my money into this because I'm 95% sure that the reissuing of our production permit is not an issue. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. Go big or go home when it comes to exploration stocks. Don't even waste your time with small exploration stocks or management teams that think smallly. Uh, when I discover that or get that sense from a management team, I immediately sell the stock. But in regards to these smaller mines, if they have some of these things going for them, I don't mind putting in ten dollars to $50,000 and turning that into fifty dollars or to $400,000 if it's successful. And also a lot of times you, you do want the upside, right? You want the exploration upside. And a lot of these smaller mines, if it's a narrow vein mine, the exploration upside will, it can be unknown in times because they don't just spend tens of millions of dollars to drill out the resource. It doesn't make sense with narrow vein mines. You kind of follow the mine. So that, and that's the case with Impact Silver. The, the full upside is not even known. So you don't know the full upside, but you want management to show you in the market that there, there is potential for growth. And a lot of times, some of these operators, they'll have a pipeline that they already kind of have laid out to where they say, here's our growth at our flagship asset. That is the primary value driver. But then we also have these assets in the pipeline that down the road, we believe will be in production in three years and then five years or whatever. But I'll just give you this advice based from based on my own observation and based on the recent difficulties with Arcana Silver is that 
invest solely on that flagship asset and your thinking and your conviction that you can make money on just this asset in whatever time frame that you give the management team to perform for you. Because oftentimes that second asset, in fact, most times it never comes online or the economics are never as good as the management team said, unless you're in some rip roar and bull market and the management team is top tier and they're able to knock it out of the park. Great. But in the case of Arcana Silver, as I mentioned, they actually started the mill, as you know, produced two videos there. I saw the mill in production and then the mines currently shut down, had extreme geological difficulties among other things. Now the primary flagship mine is not in production. They need money. And so the second permanent mine, the Shafter mine in Texas, that was supposed to bring on, I believe, 3 million ounces a year in about 18 months from now. Well, that was talked about as the upside. Well, that's completely irrelevant now. That mine, in terms of the valuation of the company, has little valuation if you can't get the flagship into production and keep it in production. So when you're looking at these smaller mines and what it can do for you as a shareholder, it's not going to give you a world-class deposit, but can it make you a five or 10 bagger? That's really all you as a little guy investor should care about. And so just wanted to share some thoughts that have been rolling around in my head uh, recently. And after taking a position in, in a smaller mine uh, recently that I think can give me that five to 10 bagger potential in two years, wanted to share some of these thoughts. I wish you the best. Thanks for listening to the show. If you listen in audio form only, if you wouldn't mind leave rating and reviewing us on whatever podcast app you listen to, I would appreciate that. And I wish you much success in all your junior mining speculative endeavors. Bill Powers signing off. Thank you.